Hi Martin, welcome to the show and thanks for joining us. No problem at all. Um, today we're going to be talking about your new book, Smoke Hole. Sure. Um, looking to the wild in the time of the spyglass, which I believe you've got a copy of. I do, yeah. Here. Yeah. Um, but before we get into that, I was wondering if you could just tell us a bit more about yourself, uh, your background as a storyteller and writer. Sure. Uh, so we are talking from... Uh, South Devon, the fringe of Dartmoor, where I have lived in one iteration or another for a long time. I was born in Torbay nearby. I'm probably equally known at this point as a writer and as an oral storyteller. So I've written many books, I suppose about a dozen, usually looking at what you could think of as the landscape of a mythology and the mythology of a landscape. So I like stories where our relationship to the wider earth gets all tangled up yeah, together. Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. Uh, and what was it that drew you to that kind of writing? Well, what drew me to it was direct experience. Okay. So when I was about 23, uh, I'd had a very different type of life, but I'd ended up on a mountain or a large hill, at least uh, in Snowdonia called Kata Idris, or around it actually, where I fasted for four days and nights. And in the old kind of storytelling tradition, they say, if you spend a night up there, you come down mad, dead or a poet. And so I went up for four nights to make sure, came back and the message was clear, you have to change your life. So I then spent a lot of time uh, being mentored by various figures, a man called David Wendelberry, another guy, Nick, Nick Twilly, were really essential characters. Um, and I became very interested in how the earth and the human inhabitants of it talk back and forth to each other. And it seemed to me that ancient myths were a kind of braille or Morse code about that, how that used to happen. So in old stories, we get clues about how to live. Absolutely. And was it then that you started writing after your... Not immediately. No. No, not immediately. I was, um, I lived in a tent for four years, believe it or not. Wow. Big black tent. It wasn't a kind of tent you'd get at Tesco's. No. Uh, and I didn't think about writing until I quite unexpectedly at a dinner party, got out of the tent to go to a dinner party. I met a man called Joe Strummer, who was the singer with a band called The Clash. And Strummer, you know, without any weight to it at all, said, oh, you should write about things you're interested yeah. in you should write a book and that was the first time that even that possibility had entered my head uh, but over time that became a reality I did a PhD I became a doctor of mythology believe it or not or a doctor of philosophy and it you know it's 10 years ago this month my first book came out a branch from the lightning wow. tree and then incrementally bit by bit by bit I think the books have got clearer and clearer in quite what it is I want to explore because it takes a while with, with any discipline. Their message is definitely developed. And yeah. yeah, you can definitely see that as you're reading them. Oh, good, good. And so that that's that's how that has been. Uh, and Dartmoor especially has been a major focus of my attention, especially a book called Scatlings, where I spent about five years exploring the folklore of the moors and then walking the geography of them wow yeah that sounds beautiful so many amazing places on dartmoor isn't there yeah there really is and what books and authors have been an inspiration for oh, you that's a good question that's a good question as a child the two most important names really would have been the writer Alan Garner and the writer Susan Cooper. And they came in at extraordinarily vulnerable moments when I was a child. And I, I've said this recently, I sort of hid in those books while I went through the, the turbulence of my life at the time. And I realized that suddenly books, in the words of Gary Snyder, are our grandparents for many of us uh, books contain what you could think of almost as ancestral knowledge, things yeah. handed down. So they were the big ones, of course, like everybody, 
I was exposed to C.S. Lewis, I was exposed to Tolkien, but my own discoveries, my primal, unique, no one told me about them discoveries were Alan Garner and Susan Cooper, who to this day, their work gives me goosebumps. Then um, I would have for a long time been in the kind of thought processes of an American writer and poet called Robert Bly. And in fact, if you look behind you, I don't, I'll move this for a second. That's a picture of the, you can't really see this on the wall up there. That's the two, that white haired old man and myself. Bly became a teacher of mine and I ended up actually leading a, a mythopoetic conference of his, the Great Mother Conference in the States for 10 years. So Bly was important. A philosopher called Gaston Bachelard has been very important. Um, an anthropologist called Carla Stang, I've worked with her a lot. Her work has been really important to opening my thinking up. Roberto Calesso, all, all sorts of people, to be honest. As you can see, my house is filled with books and I could yes. speak about it for many hours. Beautiful. And with the lockdown and Corona and everything, how do you feel that's affected your creativity and your writing? Obviously, at the start of the book, you do mention that it was written as a direct response almost. So how do you feel it's? Well, I think it I think for quite a bit of lockdown, it was productive. And then I went a bit a bit nutty around last Christmas. I think the last two or three months of Christmas were where I, I went from it being an experience of solitude to an encounter with isolation, which is really different. Yeah, absolutely. Solitude is productive to me. Even a bit of melancholy is productive. But suddenly uh, I was just down there deep inside myself, starting to withdraw from people. And so writing Smoke Hole has been an opportunity actually to transmit what, whatever small insight I may have about this experience out into the world in a tradition I understand quite well, which is the fairy tale tradition. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, and you also run the West Country School of Myth. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a bit more about that? Oh, the West Country School <laughs> of Myth. I'm something I'm very proud of. We are almost 18 years old, so we've almost become an adult. <laughs> I thought of it like that. Um, the School of Myth was founded in that tent that I lived in, wow, the black okay. tent. I had three students, one of whom is about 15 yards outside, Johnny Bloor. Uh, Johnny Bloor told me that he was going to go to see a life coach. And I was so appalled with him saying he was going to see a life coach. Uh, I said, I'll create a course if you pay Just me 80 you. pounds per weekend wow. to do it. And three of them came. That became the School of Myth. And by then I had trained in the wilderness work that I described where you go up and spend four days yeah. fasting in a wild place. And the School of Myth was a combination of the mythopoetic storytelling tradition I was working on and this white right, passage stuff. So it was big news the next year when I think we got six people. We couldn't believe, I couldn't believe that six people had come. And there was now enough money at the end of a weekend to buy, I remember buying fish and chips, four cans of Guinness uh, and a book. And I thought, well, that's worth it. Perfect. Uh, and then the next year there was 30 people and now there's 60. And the only reason there's 60 and not 150 or 200, because we, we're very busy, imagine, yeah. uh, is because actually after 60, it becomes a little unruly for a mm. process. It becomes a bit more like a conference or a festival than a gathering where I, where I really wanting. want to work with students, yes. Wow. And in your book, Smoke Hole, one of the phrases that really stood out was, um, I'm to be wedded to the thinking of the wild. Mm. I just think that's really beautiful. What does that mean to you when you say that? The thinking of the wild comes back to something I was talking about a minute ago, where I have a, an instinct, not a belief exactly, but an instinct, that certain ancient stories have a thread in them that's not from an entirely human point of view. And in this moment of climate emergency, to be connected to that more than human point of view seems a very good thing. Yeah. So the thinking of the wild is something that I first encountered through spending so much time alone in forests or in moors. 
In other words, the movement of crows over a Norfolk field or the leap of a salmon uh, in a Dartmoor River, it's a kind of thinking if you can slow down enough to behold it as so. And so the thinking of the wild is for me, from a human point of view, your capacity to realize you are endlessly receiving stories and information from the world around you. It doesn't usually come with the phrase once upon a time, that's a kind of yeah. human condition, but it's really talking about something that indigenous cultures have always understood, which is this, get this Becky for the big idea. Okay. Your soul mostly lives outside of your body, not inside, because I grew up, I would gesture here and think of my heart or my soul, but actually some of it could be outside. We, yeah. As you and I are sitting here now, we can hear bird song. Well, from an indigenous perspective, that bird song is part of our wider psyche. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, looking at the trees, you can see the connection and feel the connection between humans and the land. Yeah. Definitely. And with sort of that um, point of view and that thing, it almost relates quite a lot to the uh, Jungian psychology of um, the, our, our memories and our sort of ancestral. And do you think that plays into it? Yes. Now, I'm not a Jungian, just, just for the record. Uh, but what Jung is getting at, and Jung is without question a genius, and so much of what we perceive as mythology now, or even depth psychology, really is coming from the huge glut of Jung's work in the mid 20th century. Um, I am not very fond of certain words that have become popular through Jungian work, like uh, archetype or projection. And the reason I'm not mad crazy about them is that if you think about those words, there's no image in them. Yeah. I can't see an image when I see the word archetype. It's, I, can't, I don't know what that is. It's a bit bloodless. Mm -hmm. So as a storyteller, I'm always wanting to find words with images at the center, because again, that old idea that the soul lives outside of the body, an ancient idea is that the soul is fed by images. So okay. if I'm working with abstract language, I am thrilling a certain part of my brain, Yeah, of course. but I'm not getting into what they call the chthonic, the deeper dimensions yeah. that storytellers are really interested in getting to with a group of people. Yeah, that, that definitely makes sense. And it is true with the, the way that storytelling can really just evoke so much within you. But it is about the words when you hear two different storytellers, someone who's sort of a verse storyteller or, or someone who's a bard, you know, that really has that. It, the feelings it invokes is so different than... Yes. So you're saying something very important there, aren't you? That three storytellers could tell the same story, but you'd have a favourite. Yes, absolutely. Because of the, the way they speak, the images they conjure up through their words, through their storytelling. And I think, and the music they use and that kind of, that kind of thing. Um, and one of the stories in your book is mm. the story of the spyglass. Yeah. How do you, how do you think, feel that relates to our current times? I absolutely feel it relates to our current times. So the story that Becky is referring to is a story I found from the Caucasus um, where it in basically the, the story revolves around a daughter of a chieftain who's been given a present. She's been given a spyglass and wherever she puts the spyglass, she can see any part of the world instantaneously. All information is relayed to her, but the twist is she cannot be married or wedded to anyone that she can find with the spyglass. The only way you can marry her is to defeat the spyglass, to find a place where you can't be found. And it turns out that the only place, plot spoiler, I'm afraid, <laughs> um, 
that you can't be located is directly under the feet of the young woman. And so that's where the uh, suitor goes along with various animal allies. So of course, it's telling us something about technology. So my question, it's not that, it's not that technology is the enemy. It's not that it is essentially luciferic, although people try to put those words in my mouth. My question is just this in the book. When did a tool become a god? When did a tool become a god? I've always asked people in my work, what temple do you serve in? Not that people are ostensibly necessarily religious or spiritual, but they're all serving something. There's something that they're in, their attention keeps coming back to. So I noticed in this last bit of lockdown that, you know, uh, I'm spending too much time with the aggressive and very sophisticated um, techniques of social media, trying to be in a constant state of persuasion yeah, with my tastes. And I have to say, as the father of a teenager, I'm acutely aware of this because I want the child and I want all our children to get familiar with the ground underneath their feet that the spyglass can't find. In other words, your, your mythic ground, the ground that is unique to your story. At this point in, I'm sure it's the same for you where you live, a lot of, a lot of younger friends of mine are on great quests and they're gobbling lots of uh, what I call visionary vegetables, ayahuasca, or they're going off all over the world, well they did before lockdown, yeah. and they're asking who am I really, and I salute some of that and I totally understand it and I get it, but my caution always is to make the move for replacing all that growth with a little bit of depth, because frequently right underneath Absolutely. the strangeness of our family, the challenges that we face in our lives, that is mythic material. You don't need to go to Amazonia or Siberia to find it. It's living in Milton Keynes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it, if, you, if you take that time to focus more where you are, people always want to get away from where they grew up, I guess, don't they? And and which I think yeah. I've moved away from where I, I was born, but it is easy to think uh, sort of things like out there, different country, different place. Once I get there, that's when I'll be happy. Mm. But it's nice to sort of see that actually if you, you look down underneath your feet, then you can find that happiness there. Yeah. And that rightness, I think as well, which is really nice. Um, another story in there is uh, The Handless Maiden, mm. one of my favourite tales. Uh -huh. One, Yeah, absolutely love it. See, um, what? how do you think that that ties in both to the story of the spyglass and our times at the moment? Okay, I think in, in two ways off the top, absolutely off the top of my head. One is, of course, the very obvious thing is that for the last year, we've been told not to touch anything. So we've been effectively handless and to wash our hands immediately. And we're living in a moment where there is a modicum of possibility that it's not that things will be like they were, but possibly something new and interesting could be coming. So one of the questions the book asks is how do, the book asks three real questions. How do we grow our hands back? How do we break the enchantments of being stuck in our own head for so long? And thirdly, in terms of the sort of aggressive assault you can get from social media about you know you've got to be this kind of shape you've got to be living this kind of life i call it kicking the robbers out of the house and saying no i'm going to have a bit of agency here and i'm gonna i'm going to follow the things that really set fire to my own heart so back to the handless maiden so first thing is the question how do we grow our own hands back and the story of how she does that again sorry plot spoiler she grows them back in community she grows them back in a community of women and I find that very exciting and a pointer for all of us women and men about a way of getting through this that's not just about the solo individuated heroic journey 
for something wider and more supportive. I'm in yeah. favor of that. Secondly, the image in this, there's an image in the story where the handless maiden who's now lost her hands, which is the way she reaches out and touches the world. Her partner tries to create some silver hands for her, but don't really do the job. Now, of course, when I think about social media, I wonder about, are we really being given silver hands yeah. where the real condition of our soul is much, much more deeper and more urgent? And silver hands can seduce us, but they don't do the real work. They're not what work. they should be, yeah. yeah. I like as well in the story how it's obviously the woman grows her hands back by the community of women, but the her partner, the man, also goes through that yeah. um, sort of transformation and exploration of himself and his community of men but also in communion with nature it's not it's focusing on how our connections with nature and the wilderness in general can yeah. draw us together as couples and as people yeah yes there is this great part of the story where her husband the, the husband of the handless maiden who you could now think of as the woman that actually grew her own hands back has to go into the forests and find her in their little child, but it takes him seven years. And I think that sometimes happens in relationships. It can take you seven years to find each other. Absolutely, the the real you, not the, the front that you put on for other people. And it, it does yeah. take time to break that down, doesn't it? So I think it's that's really sort of speaks to that side of people growing into their relationship and learning each other in their relationship. And seven years is obviously quite a, um, important number in sort of myth and folklore um you see lots of pilgrimages that take seven years or seven nights um so i just i really like the way it all ties in i think that's really lovely did you want to read an expert from the book i wasn't planning to but as one happens to be <laughs> here's one i prepared ahead. earlier yeah. here's what i didn't prepare earlier yeah um Let's have a little look. There will be something. Yeah, I'll read this. Let us start by kneeling down because the thing I'd love to talk about is beneath us, that ground that the spyglass can't quite access. It's a little worn possibly with hurt feelings, but it's there. Oh, I went Devon then. Very Devon. <laughs> it's there my love. It's a prayer mat because we're all praying to something. And I know there's a lot to hold our attention right now. Everywhere I glance, there's a screen pummeling us with statistics, but I'm going to ask us to lower our gaze for a moment, you and I. So examine the weave of your mat, scrunch up your nose and rub up to the dizzy, strange scent of its perfume. There is no one size fits all mat. There are countless millions of prayer mats and every last one is different. They're just enough room for you to kneel on and that's about it. It may not look like much, not with all these other distractions, but we make things holy. And this is one of the most important parts of the book, really. We make things holy by the kind of attention we give them. So let's really look at the weave of the prayer mat. It's moving. There's a Norwegian tugboat pulling into Alexandria at midnight. There are pale stars over a Provencal castle. There's a desert woman weaving an emu feather into her hair. If we keep paying attention to this little stretch of rug, strange things start to happen. We start to witness a secret history of the earth. Fantastic, thank you. <laughs> Just the words in that, just the images it conjures up is so strong that it really makes you want to, to do what the book has said and really focus inwards and downwards, which is really lovely. Uh, are you working on anything else at the moment as well? I'm always working on something else. Uh, I'm usually working on two or three things at the same time, but I cannot speak of them. No, okay. I cannot speak of them other than they are stimulating and charming to me. And as is the way I'm sure with all writers, 
whatever you're doing at that moment, you think it's the best thing you've ever done. So, of course, I'm doing the best thing I've ever done. Well, I look forward to it coming out. Bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for joining us on the show and um, doing it in person as well, which is really nice after a year, over a year of doing everything on a computer screen. Um, So, yeah, really appreciate it. And it was a fantastic interview. No problem. Thank Thank you you very much. Bye-bye, folks.